How's it everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Marketing Fix podcast. Today we have Erwin Linda in the studio and Erwin is a Facebook and Instagram ads magician and one of the co-founders of Luna Digital. Erwin, welcome. Thank you, Yandre. I really appreciate that, man. Um, it, it actually always feels so weird whenever we, we sit down, like we're both Afrikaans people, but then we just naturally jump into like the English zone. I think it's because we're in Santon, probably, right? Maybe. <laughs> well, I do <laughs> have, I've been speaking English since I, was, I, was, I, was sort of, I thought about it the other day. Um, I'm purely Afrikaans bred, but after school I went to Italy, spoke English and Italian there for about three years. Then I moved to Stolbe for a brief time. George was purely Afrikaans, but in 2013, my journey started. I met my wife in 2011. She's English, and I've been speaking English ever since. So when it comes to business terms and marketing terms, I'm just so used to speaking English. Even when typing, when I'm typing mails, I think a lot of people yeah. can relate. Like It's just so much easier to type business and, and marketing emails in English. I struggle to find the right words in Afrikaans. So if this podcast had to be in Afrikaans, I think it would be a mess, just <laughs> purely because I don't know the right words, probably. I would have no clue what to say when it came to Facebook as in Afrikaans. I'm very sorry. Like This podcast <laughs> wouldn't happen if it was in Afrikaans. Cool, man. So again, thank you so much for coming through. Um, I think from our side, you know, we had Nanga on the show a couple of episodes ago, and he, you know, he's obviously one of the co-founders of Luna Digital, and he talked a lot about social media branding, organic tactics on Facebook and Instagram, on how small businesses can go about marketing their, their businesses, and I think he added a lot of value, and I thought, let me invite you on the show. I think it's going to be cool to talk about the paid side specifically for Facebook and Instagram, um, and like I said before, like I think that you are one of the magicians. Uh, you know, We've come a long way. I think we've known each other for about a year or so. Um, you've joined one of our masterminds. We've been on a couple of, you know, we've actually worked together on a couple of accounts before as well. So I thought, come on board, share some knowledge. And I've seen online and I've, and I think through the, just the grapevine and, and speaking to Nanga as well, you guys had some really good success for some of your clients during lockdown. So I thought like, come on board, share some tactical tips and yeah, thanks for coming, man. Really appreciate that. Um, honestly for the invites as well. Um, I think for now, really, we can say it's so far so good. Because I do truly believe from a financial point of view and an economical side of things, in our current market, we haven't seen the worst of it. But we're, we're sort of riding the waves right now. And uh, the last wave that we rode for one of our other clients did pretty well. They were in a position essentially where they weren't allowed to ship anything. But these guys sat and said, well, look, we don't have the credentials to actually go and uh, get some funding from the governmental point of view. So they had to think innovatively. And that's when they approached us. And uh, we built out a strategy for them that, was sort of innovative and something that they didn't think was possible doing it now, but without Facebook and online, they wouldn't, wouldn't really be able to do it as effectively in my opinion. Maybe it's because I'm biased, maybe it's because we focus so much attention on these channels, but that's essentially what, what we did and I'd love to share that with you guys today. Awesome, and yeah, and, and maybe let's start with the client's name. Are you allowed to share that? Was it confidential? Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we've already spoken to them, and they and they said, yeah, that's, we, we can sit down and actually have an interview if, if that ever came to it, because um, they're, they're quite astonished at what actually happened. Now, yeah. that's, that's going to be a technology partner of ours, Rugged SA. They okay. close by in, um, they, I think, in North Riding, last time I checked. Uh, but besides the point, though, these guys um, have an offline and an online sales base. Uh, they only have one office, and uh, where we focused majority of it was to get them pre-orders through the gates, where they weren't allowed to ship. So essentially, we wanted to only build up some some cash flow, get that into the bank, so that they can pay all of the employees, stay cash flow, stay afloat, and help them through that month. Up until we we then had the. Uh, the next intervention with the president and they told us, okay, listen, it's going to be softened. Uh, a lot more businesses are going to open up. E-commerce is going to be opened up. And that's mm-hmm. really when we opened up the floodgates and uh, started scaling what we already initially planned for them. So Rugged is, I think, I mean, I'm not necessarily that familiar with the products and services that they offer. And maybe for those listening, what exactly do they do? Yeah, sure. They, they are, are sort of your new generation outdoor warehouse if I could call it that. Okay, cool. They, they're into outdoor products. They're into everything, the name called Rugged. So if, if you're thinking of something Rugged and it's technological based, that's what they sell. So if you're thinking of a phone, it's Rugged. Okay, you can throw it to the window 10 stories down, pick it up, and it's evolved. It's probably a Rugged phone. Yes. And uh, they sell the same things when it comes to laptops, when it comes to tablets. Uh, that's, that's essentially where they've uh, really done well. They've partnered up with the government as well. A lot of big institutions like uh, MTN, which is an internet service provider for all of our international um, uh, viewers and listeners. And uh, they've uh, sold them scanners and these sort of things that help them through the whole process of actually um, 
going through the testing of this whole COVID thing, you know, getting getting guys on board and helping them uh, testing who's positive, who's not. And they actually use their products in the field. So okay. that was from an offline base, from a lead point of view that we developed from a Google side of things really well. So that's just went off from the Facebook side. Facebook stayed totally focused on B2C sales. Okay. That's all we did for them. So, and um, these products, I think as a brand, it sounds like they might, to some extent, it sounds quite unique, but if we had to pick a competitor for them, might it like someone be like Cape Union Mark almost? <laughs> Sort of. Um, I would still lean more towards equipment. So that would be more, you could say, yeah, Cape Union Mart, outdoor warehouse. That's essentially where, okay. you know, you, you'd get a lot of their competition. But outside of that realm, they don't really focus on more of the adventure and camping things, okay. more technology focus. So you'd ideally look at, you know, Caterpillar. Okay. They sell the same tech. They sell the same um, Can you give us some examples of some of their products? Yeah, sure. Um, so the one cell phone that, that they sell is drop-tested, shock-proof, fire-proof, you name it, whatever proof you want to call it, it's, yes. it's, it's proofed. And uh, it's it costs around... It's, it's a high ticket product, okay? Yes. It's, it's not cheap. It's going to cost you or set you back anywhere from about 5,000 Rand to upwards of about 15K. Okay. That's, and that's, that's for one item. And people mm. started buying in bulk, obviously, with this whole homeschooling thing. That helped them out a lot, where people had to study, they had to learn, and they had to work from home. So we definitely leveraged that in our marketing message. Cool, man. And I think, yeah, you guys had some success. And I think what I would love to do is to add as much value as possible to everybody listening is kind of like take me through your your thinking on, on you know, how you guys set up the campaign and what you're trying to achieve. And maybe if it's allowed, disclose maybe, you know, some of the, the budgets around it or maybe give an indication of what you think would be a good budget to start with for, for similar clients who obviously want to achieve similar results. Um, on our side, you know, we do have a lot of e-commerce clients and, and they definitely did well during lockdown. I think it's obviously the one thing that people were kind of like forced to spend money online if you had to spend money and if you had to buy products, you had to, you know, kind of gravitate to the online space in order to get those products. So a lot of the online clients actually did well even though deliveries were restricted for some time. But nonetheless, um, in general, obviously e-commerce clients are growing and, and the e-commerce business is growing. I think it was a couple of billion strong last year and there was, a, I think, about a 20-odd percent growth. In SA, obviously lockdown will affect it this year. I don't know Definitely. how the growth will be affected in terms of traditional businesses, but I do think um, it will be positive for, for the online space. But yeah, I think walk us through maybe some of, of the thinking methodology behind the campaigns. What were their main objective? Like you said, they wanted to bring cash flow into the business. They wanted to essentially then use that cash flow in order to you know sustain themselves during a very difficult time and potentially explore different product op- options or varieties. I don't necessarily know. And um, yeah, that'll be cool if you can walk us through that that strategy and thinking of the strategy specifically. Yeah, sure. Um, to to remain cognizant of the fact that these guys are on a small business. Um, from our point of view, when it comes to what they spend on paid media, so they already had a baseline of what they were spending, what they were getting, and what they could expect. So it was a very easy transition for us from a client point of view to help these guys out because they've been in the game before. Now, if you were totally new to this, my First advice would definitely be to uh, go into uh, the Facebook advertising realm with a lens of looking at it as a piece of artificial intelligence, first Mm. and foremost. I think that's really what's really made us quite divergent in the thinking of how we approach the platform is because it's a constant learning machine and what you feed it, it will then use and manipulate and then try and make sense of and make decisions based upon the objective that you give it. That's really the lens that we take when we start working with that and even Google. Mm -hmm. Now, we we go with that first and foremost. Secondly, then we would go then from a marketing point of view. So what we did initially when we jumped in is we said, okay, cool. Let's gain access to everything that you already have. Let's dive deep. Let's see what worked. Let's see what not worked. And then apply that to our new strategy that we wanted to implement to make sure that you guys are getting pre-orders through the gates and then surviving. And I guess really the, the main objective was to survive. And through survival... You, you start getting much more committed and through being committed, you start becoming creative. So it wasn't something that we pre-planned. It was something that we did more as we were getting um, a lot of response from the market. We sort of read what people were, were saying and what they found interesting and what they really found appealing and wanted to wanted more of. And we doubled down on that, you know, mm. like double down on what's working. I don't, I don't believe in reinventing the wheel when the wheel is already doing quite well. Optimize on what's already there. So um, I wish I could give the small business owner really concrete advice of, uh, you know, sort of give you the silver bullets and the secret sauce, which everyone wants. But I guess at the end of the day, everyone has their own secret sauce that their grandma makes that they love that they can't replicate. 100%. 
So from my side, I think the the, the nuggets that I kind of like, you know, dissected there was definitely the fact that they had existing data. Um, and I think we see that in our campaigns as well. The fact that if a client comes to you and they want to improve their campaigns, it's so much easier to do because you can have a look at the data and kind of make sense of it. You're kind of like a doctor. You diagnose the problem. Um, so if a company comes to you and say, hey, listen, um, you know, we want to improve our return on investment, the fact that they are already spending money on Facebook, which is this you know, sophisticated learning machine in terms of artificial intelligence, you can have a look at the data and diagnose the issue and then come up with a cure. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's kind of like what you've done exceptionally well for this client. And, and they've had some really good returns. Do you want to share what those returns were? Yeah, sure. I can give you some ROAS metrics. Um, the, these guys were consistently seeing anywhere between, and this is from a month-to-month point of view, anywhere between a 9x and 10x ROAS. This was back that's in huge. 2018. Oh, cool. And well, that's, that's massive. Great, right? And 2019. 2020 hit. January literally started. And these guys started going downhill. Now, the founder of the company is very intelligent when it comes to these platforms. He's been, you know, in, in the trenches. He founded the company. He started it. He obviously mm-hmm. had to do everything in the beginning. He had to wear all the hats. So come on. Um, he had to invest some time into it. So he knows quite, quite a bit when it comes to um, spending some time in it and spending quite a bit of money into it. And uh, he just couldn't understand why it wasn't working. And we, we got to the point where, you know, like he was spinning his wheels, um, he wasn't getting any traction and uh, we, 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 we jumped on board and we did a deep dive analysis initially. And through that deep dive analysis, like you said, you know, really just diagnosed what could have been the problem. We deployed our frameworks, which we like to call sort of an always on approach. So we take two, two approaches with that. The always on approach is sort of like a framework that we continuously run. Um, from a day to day, um, you know, from from month from day one in month till the last day, and then we have then our promotions in between that these guys would run. Mm-hmm. Now the ROAS really declined to a state where they, they they were in the red for three months, and that was sitting at like a two three x ROAS. You know, sort of something that you can imagine people outside of South Africa yes. and in countries that aren't as developed or well, are are more developed, have been spending a lot more in. Yes. So you, we had to get creative on how to really increase that ROAS and help them become more profitably consistently. And I believe right now we're, we're sort of touching that base. We're starting to become more consistent. We're, we're seeing sort of a 7x ROAS from a holistic month-to-month point of view through all of our campaigns, through okay. all of the campaigns that we're running. That's pretty cool. And, and, and you mentioned, obviously, you looked at the existing data and you identified some problems just similar to how a doctor would kind of like diagnose an issue. What were some of those problems at the end of the day? Can you recall some of them just for, you know, if, if, are, are any of them top of mind? Fluff. 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 And some examples of that? Uh, that'll be a lot of reach and engagement campaigns that weren't initially part of the actual strategy. It was not, well, what they did was they were doing all of the right things, not in the right sequence though. Mm. So they were building a lot of data which I was very happy about because we knew then how to leverage that data. And I guess, you know, at the end of the day, that's really where we kick ass and take names. I don't know if there's profanity on this podcast, but they could be today. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you say what you want to say. Cool. So that, that's really where we kick ass and take names, as I said, for, for a lot of the guys that we help. We, we, we've, we've gone through the, the ropes of, you know, working really with the guys that are already established and, and jumped onto these platforms, did well, but then don't understand why they aren't moving to that next level. Mm. And that that we've seen is sort of where we do quite well. Okay. So it's basically, and, and, this, and I see this all the time, is like a lot of times when business owners start their companies, like you said, he wore all the hats in the beginning. And a lot of respect for that. Like, I mean, yeah. I was, when I started Fitness 101 back in 2011, 10, 11, you know, I was kind of like doing the exact same thing. And um, even with VA Media, I had to run our own ads. I had to do all the campaigns in the beginning. And uh, it's, it's funny. So you have a lot of respect for that. But essentially what you realize is as you divide your focus as a, as a business owner, you start essentially dropping the ball slowly but surely. And because the online marketing space, specifically Facebook and ads, Instagram advertising, is so agile and fast moving, what worked a month or two ago doesn't necessarily going to work today. And, um, you know, a lot of times the campaigns that you ran two weeks ago would even, we've seen it, like within 48 hours, it would just fall flat. So you kind of like have to have your finger on the pulse in terms of what's happening all the time, what's working, what's not working. Absolutely. And I mean, obviously, that's the benefit of having an agency. But then at the same time, what I've seen is a lot, like you've said there, you said it's the sequence of how you put things together. Because I'm not necessarily a big believer in running reach and engagement campaigns unless you're doing it strategically. 
So, it's, and I think a lot of people, and we had a conversation prior to this recording about reach and engagement, about how I'm implementing that in, in one of our strategies that's worked quite well for us. But it's about, like you said, it's, it's about putting the puzzle pieces together. And I think it's about, like you've mentioned earlier, it's like a, the recipe. So everybody knows the ingredients, but they don't necessarily know how to put it together. I can trust, I can promise you now, um, Woolies, they give their pre-mixes out and they sell it, obviously. And I think to some extent I can put, uh, you know, put everything together and it, it's almost like edible. But if I had to give someone else the exact same ingredients, they're going to make that taste so much better, just purely in the way that they've obviously sequenced it and some additional love and, and nurturing and all the other stuff that they would have obviously added to make the cake or the, or the muffin or whatever you're baking just so much more perfect. Yeah, exactly. You, you add your own flavor to it, you know. And uh, I think that's really one of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to a brand point of view as soon as they start working with an agency because they feel like from a founder's point of view, they have such a big hold on to the vision and to the culture of what this brand stands for and the communication thereof that they feel that once they relinquish that to somebody outside of their organization or an internal team member necessarily, that becomes out of their control and something that could become tarnished and that risk was something that we had to also mitigate by sitting with these guys from a week-to-week basis and seeing how we can help them through that process. And uh, once we got it, started to get the communication right, their audience responded phenomenally. Mm. It really helped out. And uh, really, this is something you mentioned, you mentioned as well, you know, like you need to put the puzzle pieces together. It feels sometimes like you're doing a 1,500 puzzle piece, you know, like it's killing you. Mm. You don't know what to put where. you got to start somewhere. You've got a corner here, but the other corner falls off. The horse looks like a donkey. And you don't yeah. know like what to do. Now, my best advice would be to focus on the basics. Make sure that your communication style is human still. Whereas you'd be focusing on speaking to a person singularly as opposed to speaking to somebody. I think this, this is something from a traditional marketing point of view that, that, that we've learned back in the day. 100%. Where, you know, you're speaking to someone as a singular person. You're not speaking to the masses. You're making it personal. And something that we've, that we've seen really did well in a rugged specific case was that we, we started speaking to people at a granular level. We started timing the interactions that we had with them. So for argument's sake, we, we had between five specific dynamic product ad campaigns that we were running with specific allocated budgets, depending upon how big the audience was. And we started speaking to people from a, the first day that they interacted with a specific product, and then after three days, after seven days, and after 14 days. So I just want to stop you there quickly. Yeah, sure. um, dynamic product ads, for those who don't know, maybe just give them a quick, uh, kind of like an explanation of yeah, what sure. that is on Facebook. For the noobs, it's literally you creating a Facebook catalog off of the website that you've built, which could either be on Shopify, could be WooCommerce, whatever the case might be, is you then uh, create that on uh, your Facebook page and link that to your website. Now, what you would then essentially do is, is you can then use those dynamic product ads um, and and uh, put them in front of people that have seen a specific product. So if I'm going to say, if I saw that f- specific phone that I spoke about earlier and uh, I didn't buy it essentially or I added it to, to uh, the cart and I hopped off, then I could then, as an advertiser, put that specific ad of the phone in front of that person after how many days he's, he's viewed it. That gives you the contextual edge, mm. you know? Okay, no, that's very cool. So I think I just wanted to make sure that, because there's a lot of small to medium-sized business owners listening and a lot of them are running their own ads and I think that's obviously just one of the things that I wanted to highlight there because it's a quite a powerful tool if you use it correctly. Absolutely. And like we've seen, that obviously you guys have done that. Um, so you were saying, like you were doing dynamic product re- uh, retargeting ads, seven days, 30 days, 45 days, Please continue. Yeah, sure. So, you know, from a top of final point of view, um, you, you, you're just looking to build as much data as possible. We are still conversion focused from a top of final point of view. Please, please don't um, uh, think, think that we're only sending traffic and spending money. At this point, we still want to convert people, but we know and uh, from experience, we've seen that they won't convert at the rate that you want them to, to uh, convert. But then again, the, the, the focus is you're getting quality traffic and that's why we will still optimize for that mm. as opposed to building traffic. You know, you, you'll have a much bigger audience to work off of if you, you're running traffic campaigns for argument's sake or you're using a lower intent objective which would be a view content or you know, a page view. But then again, though, you're going to be spending more from down the line at the bottom side of the funnel because you're... you're you're sort of advertising to a big base, essentially. Mm-hmm. So from the smaller business, I, I would advise you still to look at optimizing for higher intent objectives, making sure that you're getting quality traffic through that have the intent potentially uh, as opposed to um, somebody that would add a product to cart or use the view content um, uh, objective or 
what's the event? Sorry for that. Yes. It just slipped my mind here. As, as, as I'm thinking, I hope that um, yeah, everyone understands what I'm saying here. So as we're going pretty deep. What I'm hearing you say is that, and yeah, let, just, just, just that it doesn't go atop, <laughs> over everybody's head here, is that in the, even though traditionally we have top funnel, middle funnel, bottom funnel, top funnel being people who you know, essentially doesn't know the brand or have no idea who the brand is, uh, these individuals have probably seen similar brands but not necessarily yours. Mid funnel would then usually be people who have engaged with your brand in some way, shape, or form. Uh, maybe you've seen an ad, maybe visited the site, uh, but not necessarily have taken any specific action that would, you know, prove that they are actually a prospect to become a client or a customer. And then bottom funnel, are obviously, people who now have visited your pricing page or have added something to their carts, or uh, you know, people who visited the about you section. And essentially, those people, when they get retargeted. In theory, usually the CPA, the cost per acquisition, is a lot lower. So what I've hearing, what I'm hearing you say is like essentially what you guys have done in terms of targeting top funnel. You know, you don't just do it for brand awareness perspective. You say, hey, look, you know, check out this product. If you like it, buy it. Um, and essentially, you would have maybe a little bit of a higher cost per acquisition, but yet you're getting money into the business. And those people essentially then getting retargeted. Um, maybe uh, with upsell offers or, you know, becoming lifetime value, like essentially, uh, you know, getting people back to the side and buying more. Um, maybe just elaborate a little bit on that from, because that's kind of like what I'm he- hearing you saying here. Is that yeah, sure. No, you, you're on the right tangent there. Uh, essentially, we, we were very lucky at the beginning and uh, we mentioned this before that these guys already have data. So we were put in a position that we were able to actually do that. We were able to run conversion campaigns to actually convert people on the fly cold. And for you to be able to do that, I believe, is one of the biggest skills um, in, in this game from an advertising point of view, specifically from Facebook and Google side of things. If you can convert people cold without data, yeah. you truly are a magician. Well, and that means basically that means that someone who's never, ever seen your brand has no idea who you are, but yet after the first engagement actually buys something from your online store. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that's, that's, that, that's what we did. And the biggest reason why we did that is this isn't normal for us to do that because, you know, the standard procedures would be to build your dots and make sure that, you know, you're capturing a lot of attention, good attention, and then converting on the back end. And that's really where we're going to be making the majority of our money. Now, we, we did that initially because we had dots and that because we were conversion focused. These guys were in dire straits. Mm. They didn't have funds f- to last them two months. Mm. They wanted to thrive during this time. And I think the attention that we captured through utilizing these pre-orders and also for the social uh, capital that they've already achieved or collected, um, that's really done a lot for them now coming out of this. And this is something that we've said, you know, like if you're on the e-commerce space, you're lucky enough to be able to trade online, you had to double down during this time um, if you were able to trade, if you were able to sell, because at the end of the day, you're going to be capturing a lot of underpriced attention, Mm. which we've seen. And now with our economy opening up slightly a little bit more, costs are slowly but surely rising. That's what we've seen in the back end. 100%. And a quick question from my side would be, have you, did you guys time specific offers like maybe with around payday, uh, retarget people who have been, because usually between the 25th and the, and the 7th of every month, you know, people would have a little bit, they would have fatter wallets. Um, and essentially what, what we've seen is that retargeting people doing those times specifically actually lowers CPAs and obviously drives your return on investment. Uh, a lot of people do this always on, which is sometimes completely fine. But I mean, just consider just considering your strategy and what you guys have done. Is that something you, you, that you've done or wanted yeah, to look we've, at? Yeah, we, we've tested that extensively which, with each individual client. I think it depends on what sort of product you're selling. You really need to think about that. What product am I selling? Is this sort of something that I want or is this something, you know, cyclical? Is it mm-hmm. is it consumable? You know, from a, uh, let's call it cosmetics, from a supplemental point of view, I would definitely advise doing that because that's when majority of the masses mm. are getting paid. You know, anywhere between from the 20th if you work in the banking sector up until the 11th if you're working in transport. Mm. So that's, that, that's really the window that we worked on. For these guys specifically, it's a vanity product. It mm. really is. Our biggest converting week was middle of the week. Okay. And considering the fact that, you know, it's a high ticket item, so if the item is already expensive, so if you can afford it, you know, it doesn't really matter what when payday is because of the fact that your salary probably, you know, there's extra margin for, for stuff like this. I if suppose. you're liquid, you're liquid, I guess. Yeah. No, perfect, man. And I think uh, essentially we, you touched on the basics before we started talking about the, the funnel and, and, and how you've structured those campaigns in terms of top middle and, and conversion at the bottom. Uh, you mentioned being personal and I think a, a part of that is also being able to resonate with people, getting in, inside their heads. And I think 
is it David Ogilvy that said, you know, the, the best marketers answers the questions that are actually happening in the consumer's minds. At that time, yeah. At that time. Um, so being personal is, is obviously really important. You mentioned timing of the offers um, that we've chatted about. And uh, you've mentioned, obviously, the, the, the retargeting. So you depend, we, we also uh, depend a lot on, on the machine learning and the, and the AI of Facebook because the exact same thing happened with us. We had a client in New York. Um, the company is called Stitch Stitch Brands. I need to speak to Gilbert. Like he's obviously the head of, of the account. I think it's Stitch something. Um, and they actually came to us quite desperate and mentioned the fact that um, they were averaging at about thirteen dollars a CPA. So it cost them thirteen dollars to get someone to buy something from them, which is the equivalent of about two hundred and fifty bucks or two hundred bucks now with the rand dollar. And it skyrocketed to about twenty. $20, $25. Oh, that's, that's crazy. Over the last, yeah, so it's almost doubled in the last 90 days. And obviously, you, you can blame lockdown. You can blame, you know, the fact that uh, the U.S. is probably going into some sort of recession. Um, but they did everything in-house, and they kind of came to Gilbert and, and basically said, look, um, we're desperate. Can you help? And funny enough, the exact same ha happened where they had a lot of existing data to work with. So we didn't necessarily have to do too much in terms of planning a brand new strategy. We just had to diagnose the actual issue and find a bit of a cure or a short-term solution, you know, something that can at least, you know, lower the CPAs over the next two months while you work on a brand new strategy or whatever it is. Um, just to relieve the pain, you know. Just to relieve the pain, exactly. Um, so you were talking that the fact that they obviously, their ROAS uh, dropped quite significantly. Where is it now and, and where do you think you guys can take it? Well, we've gotten them back to profitability um, in month two. Sorry, month so one. So 60 days and they're back to making profit. 30 days. Sorry. Okay, wonderful. 30 days. That's um, great. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't magnificent by all means. We, we, we got through the skin of our teeth, but then again, the business survived. Yes. And they were thankful because that's something that they didn't have. Now, they didn't feel like they were throwing money down the toilet anymore or just you know, holding a lot of cash and burning it. At this point, we're sitting at a 7.8x re uh, return. Solid. Yeah, that's, that's, that's where we're sitting now. It's, it's nice because we like selling high ticket products because from an advertiser's point of view, you, you can get to that ROAS metric uh, relatively easy from our, from our experience. But then again, though, to then go and measure the profitability of that, that's, that's where it starts becoming difficult. Because remember, this is a product that doesn't have a lot of profit in because a lot of people are selling it. And it's something that almost everyone needs and uses. So that's something that they've, that they've struggled with. But now through averaging everything out, looking at the ROAS metrics, if we can scale from here, keep it at the same ratio, mm. then really the moon's the limit at this point. 100%, man. And you mentioned there that the fact that you like selling high ticket items. And I want to touch on that because I think it's so crucial. We have burnt our fingers in the past as an agency very when we just started out uh, you know you would take on anybody who want, has an online store or essentially anybody who's willing to give you money right we've been there and um, essentially what happens is that you say yes we can help because you truly believe that you can not because you want to take someone's money when you're knowing that you can't so it's like yes we can because you do we do believe that we could do what we do the same way everybody else does um, but what we've seen is that sometimes it's just not profitable um, and what I mean by that is sometimes your products and, and what it's costing you to buy those products and what you're selling those products for, it doesn't justify a, a profitable, it, it doesn't justify the ad spend. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to say is like, it, it, you're not necessarily going to have a digital marketing strategy that's profitable. So these companies come to us and say, you know, I'm selling my product for 500 bucks or 300 bucks. It's costing me 200 bucks to buy. And essentially the, the gross margin or the gross profit essentially is about a hundred bucks, but that's before shipping. You know, that's before the other expenses in terms of warehouse and staff and everything else. So they're only making 100 bucks and probably a lot less. So after your first order, having have to pay the agency for management fees, have to, having have to pay Facebook in order to advertise on that platform, and then after covering the shipping and everything else, you're actually running at a loss. And it doesn't matter how many products you sell necessarily, you're always going to be running at a loss unless customers start buying from you every single month religiously. And I just want to get your takeaway on that. It's like essentially like at what point do you guys decide, you know, this is the kind of clients you can work with? Is there a certain price range? Just purely because for us it's about if you're selling a product about a thousand rand and up, then there is room to work with. And then we believe there's some way that you can kind of like make it profitable depending on, I would say, the financial investment obviously that you have and the cash flow, I would say that the burn rate of the cash flow that you have in the bank and how long you can obviously keep investing and, and getting people back to the site. 
But yeah, I think for us, it's about a thousand rand or so. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. And I think it's very subjective. You know, like you can sell a product for hundred rand if your cost is zero. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's 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 tough to say that, but it does get to a point where you know, like, if you're selling a supplement for four hundred fifty bucks, cost you two hundred and twenty five rand to make it, you're going to struggle to make that profitable. Mm. It really are because you just have so many other overheads that you need to cover. So you know, from our side of things, it's very close to you actually. We we, we sat and when we did the math, it was about a thousand two hundred rand mm. per product, but we need about a three hundred percent markup on that mm. to be able to make it profitable for you. That's that's what we've seen from our experience. Now it it can change. It fluctuates depending on the product, depending on the market, depending on how uh, people are used to buying these products. Remember, if I were to sell a cup of coffee, not everyone. You know, buys a cup of coffee online right now if they want to do right now. They mm. go, they go to a shop. They might order it, go and pick it up. But uh, I think it's really subjective. So my best advice in this specific scenario is really just to make sure that, and this is from a business point of view, not just from a marketing side of things. Make sure that you're not poverty pricing yourself. Mm. Really, we we believe in having um, exclusive pricing, making sure that you price yourself as well within the market. Because remember, what you price yourself as is what your customers, consumers will perceive you in the market. True. Ideally. And that's my two cents. Yeah. So I think we always advise the people and say, look, you need to crunch the numbers first. You need to keep in mind that you're going to pay us an X amount. You're going to keep pay Facebook an X amount. Um, and we really re-engineer the process. And this is how we do it. So we'll say, for example, that, you know, at the average, and this is just rough math, obviously. And it's, again, like you said, it's quite subjective, but it gives you a good guideline. So we'll say, all right, the average landing page view for Facebook, or let's call it cost per click, you know, what you're paying to get someone to your site, even though it's two different things, but I'm going to go with cost per click just for the sake of keeping it layman's terms and, and very simple. So it's, it's costing you roughly, you know, five rand a click to get someone to your site, let's say, or four rand or three rand, but let's go with three rand. So what happens is that the average website has got a conversion rate of about, a, uh, you know, 1%. You know, that would be benchmark. Like, yeah. obviously, you can do better. A lot of sites have two, three, four percent. We've seen up to six percent. Um, the unicorns of the world will probably have like 11 uh, percent. Like, I've, 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 uh, there's an article I read, like, there was one or two, I can't remember the company's name. They're sitting with 11 to 15 percent conversion rate on like high ticket items. Mm. Um, but that's unheard of. Like, I, I think traditionally, I don't know if you agree, probably no, one no, or two percent. No, I do. Yeah, no, I do. Absolutely. If, you, if you're talking about a, your, your normal Shopify store, your online store, that's ideally what, well, what it would look like um, from an industry standard. If you talk about landing page views and if, you, if you've got sort of a funnel in place, uh, something that doesn't have friction on it, you, you don't have different options to choose from, it's sort of one action you want to take, then you can obviously change that conversion ratio. But, 100%. Yeah. So three rand a click and the average conversion rate, the average conversion rate is roughly 1%. So that means that you have to drive 100 people to your store to get one sale. So at three rand a click to get 100 people, the math obviously then is three times 100, which is 300 bucks. So now we can say that it's cost you 300 bucks to make one sale. Obviously, it's a bit arbitrary and it's a bit in the air, but this, that's just basic math. So what we then do is say, cool, we can, you know, on average say, it's safe to say that you're going to pay roughly 300 rand to make a sale. What does your products cost that you're selling? Okay, cool. My product is on average 600 bucks. So now the business owner immediately thinks, hey, I can make 300 rand profit. And essentially, you know, that makes sense. Why not? Because technically it's cost me 300 bucks to sell a profit, but it's not necessarily profit, right? Because you still had to buy that product in order to list it. So then what happens is that how much do you buy that product for? And they go, okay, cool. Well, I buy the product I'm selling for um, 600 bucks. I buy for 400 bucks. So now I'm saying, well, okay, cool. It's cost you 300 bucks to get that sale plus the 400 rand that it cost you to get the product onto your store. So now it's cost you technically 700 bucks in order to sell that product, but essentially you only got 600 Rand back. So now you're running at a hundred Rand loss. And yep. that is before shipping, which is another hundred bucks. So now you're running at a 200 Rand loss. That's before warehouse expenses and staff expenses and everything else and marketing, uh, you know, paying your agency and everything else. So 200 Rand and more. So once we, you know, paint that picture, to the business owner, they go, oh, okay, cool. I need to relook yeah. at my service offering, you know, if it's service based, um, or if it's, for example, you know, an online store. And that's why we're saying like roughly a thousand, and, and I mean a thousand, a thousand two hundred bucks is a good kind of like a, an average benchmark for mm. people to go, okay, cool. There's room to work with here, depending on your margins as well. That's a very good reality check. I have to say is just to sit down, crunch the numbers, and make sure that you know if you were to invest into these channels, how do you make it profitable at the end of the day? You need a different model for um, the different way you do business. And essentially, if you're on the online space, and I agree with you totally, and you've got a online store, you need to really relook really at it 
honestly, don't, don't become so, uh, you know, tied to the fact that this is how my product works. This is how you sell it. You know, like that's, it's, it's just going to shoot yourself in the foot at the end of the day. Mm. And that's, that's, just my, that's just my opinion. I think it's because that we, we in, in our agency, have seen a lot of guys pivot so easily and so quickly. But, you know, it's, it's much easier said than done, mm. I guess. What I want to, you, you're absolutely right. And I think what, the one thing I want to add to that is that, um, you know, you can easily justify if you're a bigger business to say, okay, cool, I'll happily take a 300 rand loss to get a customer because if that customer comes back next month, essentially, you know, if they're in our email list or they get retargeted, the cost of acquisition gets cheaper next month. And then over time, that customer becomes profitable because that's what happens. But the reality is a lot of small businesses don't necessarily have that luxury. They need to make money today. Yeah. And a lot of these guys, even like with Rugged, but essentially, you know, you guys managed to pull a rabbit out of the hat there because you're Facebook ad magicians. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, but I mean, essentially what it comes down to is the fact that like a lot of small businesses need to make money today. And I think if you had to make money today, you know, you need to keep in mind, and I've said this before, digital marketing is not a silver bullet. However, if you do want to make money today, then you need to make sure that the numbers check out, that you are selling products that are profitable in order to invest that money online in order to make profit for your business. And that you also just choose the right mm. people in order to help you do that, right? And that yeah. the margins are there in order to accommodate those people. 100%, man. I think, you know, like, and this is how we would usually explain it once we sit down with someone and we have a consultation where, you know, like, your, your business is you at this point, if, if you're sort of a small business owner. You know, like, you, you emanate your business. The essence of your business is very similar to your personality and the whole thing. And uh, it's a very personal thing to you. So we would take a lens, put it in front of you and say, let's say you were somebody that's building a Fortune 500. How would you structure your pricing then? How would you pay your investors? How would you pay mm. you? How would you pay employees? How would you pay all the other overheads and the uh, necessary investments that you need to make to grow the business? How would you formulate that? Mm. And that's, I think, just a different uh, seat to sit in when you look at your business and how you would you know, structure things. No, exactly. And I think I almost advise reading the book, and I think you've probably read it before because I think I might have advised you to read it, Profit First. Yeah. So, and I think a lot of, and, and, and I've recommended this to clients. I said, hey, listen, read Profit First um, as a book. Mike Michalowicz, I don't know how to pronounce his yeah, name. Yeah, let's, let's not go to the surname. <laughs> but, I mean, for those listening, Profit First is an awesome book that talks about, you know, how you run a business that is profitable and how to put that profit, obviously, to good use if you, uh, it comes down to paying yourself or growing the business, whatever it is. But how to do the math, in, in, in essence, on how to run a business that's lucrative and a business that's profitable. So Profit First, for those who are interested, I think it's a very important read because if you are going to start an online store, if you are going to start an online business, then um, that business is going to taught you, teach you a lot uh, about the necessary math you need to do. Lots um, of nuggets today. In order to, to get you to where you want to be. So in terms of some basic advertising tips, so keeping in mind that a lot of, these, uh, peop the, a lot of the people listening might be running their own ads or a lot of them might be marketing managers in smaller to medium-sized companies. Um, being a Facebook ads magician, what... I like that word. I don't know why. I just pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, obviously being, you know, really good at what you guys do and what you do, um, you know, what would be some of the basic tips when it comes to setting up a campaign? Like, is there any nuggets that you can drop in terms of, okay, cool, if I have to give it, and I know it's obviously dependent on the goal and, and it can be quite subjective, but let's, for example, say that someone is trying to drive traffic to their online site, um, you know, and they're obviously just trying to gain some traction in terms of sales and I think you've mentioned it before that not necessarily just driving people to a home page, but driving people to, you know, a product specific page. Like I'm looking for those kind of like samples yeah, sure. and maybe examples of stuff that you can maybe give people. Um, so if you can maybe share some nuggets with us, that'll be great. Cool, man. Um, well, yeah, for, for all the listeners listening, guys, if, if you're currently advertising from a Facebook point of view and it's not working, um, it, it doesn't mean it won't ever work, I guess. Uh, but don't, don't get so stuck to the fact that it's the only channel. But my best advice right now would be to layer your uh, campaigns in terms of the interaction that people have gained with you. So if, if you're starting out with, let's say, 10,000 10, that you can invest into this and you can do it by yourself, so that's the only cost you have, is look at running three specific campaigns. Have a top tier campaign, which uh, you'll be driving traffic to your site. Hopefully, you've installed your Facebook pixel already. So you have the, uh, the event um, that need to be triggered to make sure that you know where they are in your sales funnel uh, to optimize for getting a purchase. Mm. So, yeah. And to, to, and to, to add on that, yeah, the Facebook pixel is basically, you know, a piece of tracking code that you can add mm. to your site, which will allow you to gather, I want to say information or data, but that will sound like hard data that you can just extract and utilize the way you want to, which is not true. Um, you know, it saves the data in terms of cookies and, and all kinds of like, you know, you know what I think is the best way to put it. Sorry, sorry no, to cut you off. It's no. just consumer behavior. Mm. 
like potential customer behavior. I think that's 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 the way we usually communicate that. Okay. You know, so yeah, it's basically saying like Facebook kind of like measures how people behave on your site, and then you can just retarget people based on how they behave. Yeah, sort of how much they like you. You know, like you can gauge in like, do they like my product? Do they not? Where did they jump off? And how do we communicate then? You know, like we always say, advertising is very similar to dating. Mm. And you 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 actually I actually watch a video of yours, and I, I like I killed myself laughing when when we were talking about whispering to a girl at a club. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> exactly. You know? But that's exactly how the internet is, right? And I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand it, and I don't want to go out in ten minutes rant or mm. talking about that specific analogy but the point there is is that the internet is super noisy and your customers are dancing you know right next to the dance i basically said the internet is like a dance club and um the fact that your customers are dancing right next to the speaker makes it really difficult for you to articulate your message your unique selling point so it's about luring people away luring such a weird word to use it (laughs) because like like drawing people away from the speaker so you can have a clear conversation about what your brand does and and what it actually stands for Um, and that's where I'm kind of like mentioned where people have to go sit by the bar get them Mm. over to the bar where you can have a one on one conversation you know with you know things might go and buy them a drink at least buy them a drink show them that you're interested um, in in learning more about them and I think uh, that's kind of like what it comes down to but you were saying um, building some top tier campaigns maybe some examples of that I'm glad I'm glad you actually talked about that Um, and and making your USB very attractive. So from a top tier campaign, we at least need some sort of offer that's going to be enticing. If you're selling, okay, and this this is something I don't advise you doing. Don't sell masks on Facebook. They'll shut you down. But <laughs> Have you tried? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have. Okay, good. So um, I'm, I'm speaking out of experience here. The entire business manager was, su- was shut down. We oh, had to create really? everything from the beginning. Yeah, it's, a, it's a whole story. It's like trying to sell weed on Facebook. I'm telling you, but it's not as cool. You know? <laughs> True. Any case, so um, we, we'd have some top tier campaigns with an awesome offer, something attractive, something somebody wants. You know, like once you see that ad, it's like whoa. Even if you didn't want it, you're, you're reading. Mm. You know, like that's that's sort of the the vibe that we want to get out of this specific campaign. So it needs to be very attractive, very lucrative. If if somebody, you should at least be able to get a click out of that. Um, that's that's ideally what you want. Sending traffic then to your site, and then making sure that you set up two engagement campaigns is what I would say. The the one is going to be. Um, sorry, engagement, I mean remarketing. So two two remarketing campaigns. One's going to be remarketing people that have engaged with your sites at a specific level. So if somebody's viewed the product at least, retarget them. Mm. Have a much smaller budget, allocate at least 10 to 20 percent of your of your entire budget to that specific campaign and then likewise then also for the second remarketing campaign that's going to be remarketing people that have engaged with the actual ad and post and uh, your page as well so that's going to be a different communication style as well so then leading them all down funneling towards them finally uh, purchasing your product that's that that's where we want them want to get them to uh, so literally three three campaigns that I would advise, and it's not set in stone, it's not concrete. This is sort of you know a framework that I can mm. give you that can start building out. So the last campaign would obviously be more bottle the funnel, more hardcore conversion like yeah. I suppose. What would that look like? Uh, is there an example that you can maybe give us? Yeah, discounts, man, incentives, anything okay. you can offer them. You like if you're talking about free about free shipping, almost every company does free shipping now over a specific amount. So if you can give them a free shipping amount for anything that they buy, just as you know, sort of a lost leader, I mm. guess. That, 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 that'll be pretty great. Uh, bundle some products together. Uh, make sure you're giving them something cool, something that they want, something that they've engaged with. So if they've looked at this product, make sure that you're giving them an ad that is showing them that product, not something else, mm. um, if, if that's what you want them to do. If they haven't interacted with that, layer then another campaign or another ad set that's going to give them a different supplemental product. And in the communication, in the copy, speak to them as in, you know, like, hey, did life get in the way? How about, you know? So... Uh, that actually sounded very weird, <laughs> but <laughs> that makes uh, sense. Yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's sort of the, the style that we look at and go to. You know, it becomes yet again very personal. Hundreds. You know, uh, you were saying in the beginning, like that top tier campaign is all about getting people to take note um, or stopping the thumb scroll. Yeah, right? that's what we're trying to do because mm. Facebook is like a digital billboard. Uh, you're driving on a highway, you're seeing billboards all over the show. Uh, you're not necessarily paying attention to them because there's so many and you're so immune to it. Facebook's very similar. Like there's so many yeah. ads in the newsfeed. It's basically a digital billboard. Um, you need to do something that's going to get someone to stop scrolling and be like, hey, let me quickly check this out. Yeah. Um, basic tips on, on how to do that in terms of, you know, creating ads that get people to just stop and take note. This might be a little bit contrary to how everyone else would do it. Um, go and do your research on what people like to view in your space on Facebook in terms of meme pages. Meme pages. Meme pages within your niche. Okay. Look at the type of content they create because guess what? They're getting all of the engagement. Cool. Very true. They're getting all of the attention. So how about, you know, 
breaking down the seriousness of the matter because yet again, this is a social network. Mm. You, it's, it's a social place. So, you know, like at the end of the day, you want them to purchase a product, but you don't want them to know that right away because that's sort of disrespectful to the whole process. Yet again, it's like dating. Just say hi at least first. Mm. You know, like show, show them that you care uh, about their specific needs and interests and answer the questions that they have about your product at that time that's relevant to them. As we spoke about David, uh, uh, the father of advertising. David Ogilvy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, we, we, we were lucky enough at the end, you know, for Facebook as a machine learning platform to already know who's our ideal buyers from Rugged's point of view. And that's, you know, ideally why we believe it did so well to pass all those tests and check all the boxes. You know, we answered questions that people had about the product. We were really diving down a specific pain point that everyone had, you know, like you buy a 20,000 Rand phone, break the screen, cost you an extra 5K with an excess of 3,000 Rand from your insurance. You know, they never pay mm-hmm. all of it. So like, how about you buy a phone that never breaks, save yourself 10,000 Rand and it does exactly the same. So, you know, like that, that sort of thing, you need to communicate the USPs very effectively in that sort of sense and really move people either towards pleasure or away from the pain that they've experienced. Mm. So, you know, like you got to know your product. You got to know, know your product. Um, the one thing you mentioned there is looking at meme sites. The, there was one uh, guy, I can't remember his name. I think it's the, the founder of uh, Optin Monster. Mm. I can't remember his name now. But Optin Monster is a plugin that you can use for WordPress. It helps you generate an email list. And, and we're going to talk about that not just now because I want to actually share like an interesting case study on, on how we've used Facebook ads to build up an email list and what that's actually done in now terms I'm interested. of an ROI. But um, what he mentioned was is that if you are focusing on a specific product or service, sometimes it's, again, you need to test it and see if it's going to work for you. But sometimes it's in your interest um, to try and target people you know, almost might be a bit of a contradiction. So he was using the example of selling raw, you know, raw beef directly from uh, the farm to, uh, you know, the, the consumer. So they were cutting out the middleman. And what he did on yeah. purpose, he was targeting vegetarians. <laughs> you got to be kidding me! <laughs> For um, real, he, yeah. he he purposefully added vegetarians wow. to wow. his one of his ad campaigns. So one of the ad sets were specifically aimed at targeting vegetarians. What happened was they got a lot of into actions on those uh, on those ads, and uh, that led to extremely low CPCs back to the site. Yeah. So the this is now getting very very granular here. I have to ask though, like, do you think do you, do you, do you think that's good attention though? So here's what happened. Yeah. So in the same ad set, he targeted people interested in barbecue and beef and whatever the case the case may be. In that same ad set, he included vegetarians. But what happened was there was conversations happening. So people were like oh, I'm not, you know, yeah. how can you be selling this? I don't necessarily understand. How can you guys enjoy this? And then people just started co- communicating with each other. And then Facebook is all about community. So Facebook has said it yeah. multiple times over the last two or three years. We're here to build communities. We're here to build interactions. We want to have people connect with each other, share thoughts. Um, this is what we're all about. So what he did was he basically just uh, created a bit of a spark and for people to start communicating with oh, each man. other and start sharing their thoughts. Facebook's known for that. Now, obviously, you have to keep a close eye on those campaigns because I'm, I'm sure it can go south and to some extent, it, it might be bad attention like you've mentioned before. But if one had taught well and I think if, if, if tested out, you know, well enough, and I, I do think it can obviously lead to some uh, interesting interesting feedback. But oh, yeah. what ended up happening was the, the ad itself was favored in terms of the algorithm just purely because of the fact that it had massive engagement um, and it looked like it was adding value to people's lives just purely because these conversations were happening. And uh, the, the, the landing, landing page views ended up at like, you know, it was like two cents on the dollar, basically two dollar cents, um, a landing page view, which is like 30, 40, 50, 40 cents in rands. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it was ridiculous. And I think that's just something to keep in mind. It's like sometimes everybody is so fixated on finding their ideal customer. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's uh, maybe at your interest to try and mm. test and, and see, look, maybe it's, it, I can look at, you know, some form of contradiction. Mm-hmm. And I like the meme thing because it's something that people enjoy. Um, I think Gary Vee talks about creating so many different uh, uh, pieces of content for your audience. So he'll mm-hmm. say like, if you're selling burgers, find out, you know, your audience who likes, for example, the New York Jets and then 
you know, sell burgers with a New York Jets logo. So, for example, create a piece of creative mm -hmm. where the New York Jets are playing and now you're selling burgers because you're celebrating the fact that they just won. Yeah. So, essentially, it's like finding all these simple reasons, um, you know, to basically show ads to people mm -hmm. and getting, creating an offer that's contextual to that person that you're actually targeting. So, finding someone who's interested in the New York Jets. So, for example, if you have to make it local, finding someone who's interested, for example, in the Blue Bulls team, then targeting them with a bry meat package because they just won on the weekend. Um, I love that. But so yeah. someone who's interested in the Blue Bulls, someone who's also interested in, in having bries, mm -hmm. and uh, you just combine these two interests together to create the perfect ad. So yeah. essentially that's another thing that we've slowly started mm -hmm. testing. Not too much feedback on that just yet, but uh, very interesting, yeah. I've got to say, first and foremost, I think this is awesome. I think this is, it's, it's crazy, number one, but then again, though, that's, those are the strategies that end up doing so well. I mean, I'm looking at King Price. I think their, their advertising team and Nano is probably the coolest people ever. Mm. Um, have you seen the, the type of ads that these guys are running? It, you know, they bash their competitors within means. I saw their latest one, and super. I think Tristan's mm. sitting there nodding, nodding ahead. Um, we've seen one of the latest ones during, for, during lockdown, and it, it was yeah. quite contextual, very funny, and uh, very applicable, yeah. That's, you know, that's, and that's sort of the content you should be building, you know, from a social point of view. And I love the fact that you're talking about, you know, um, building that ad. Um, with so much controversial, uh, you know, conversations around it, Facebook is a machine learning platform. It's going to favor that. That's what it's going to pick up. People are engaging with the ad. There are a lot of comments. And you're pulling people to that ad for free, essentially, that you didn't pay for because of people then socially sharing that and then getting that into the realm from an organic point of view. So, you know, like it's a, do a double-edged sword. You're, you're sort of, you know... Gaining advantage from a lot of different areas that you wouldn't have. No, exactly. And we're talking a lot about the offer. And I think sometimes, you know, it's important to be straight up front with the business owner and say, sometimes your offer just sucks. Yep. Like, yep. And, and I mean, how do you, like necessarily from your perspective, like how do you sometimes articulate that? Because we've had instances where, you know, the company that we're working with and we, and, and I think, and again, in the beginning, you know, you've taken every single client who's willing to give you money for the service. Um, you know, now we're in a position where we can say, look, dude, we, we really want to help. Um, you know, we, we really want to help you grow this business. We do think there's potential, but, you know, your margins don't necessarily make mm. sense or your offer is just not, is not good enough. Like you need to do something different. Like how, like do you agree one? And then two, how do you kind of like have to have those conversations? That's the thing. You know, like I think the long tail of that is, you know, the holy grail of e-commerce is repeat purchases. That's why these supplement companies and cosmetics companies do so well. But then again, though, you run into this sort of scenario yet again, where you could have a physical business problem, not a marketing problem, mm. essentially, where you need to look at these things and how can they, how can you fix them? And, Number one, Facebook's not going to fix them for you. Google's not going to fix them for you. So just be cognizant of the fact that it could be outside of the realm of your advertising. This could be something internally that you need to look at. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't want to make that sort of, you know, the uh, elephant in the room, but that, that is a reality and you need to look at all the subjects around that. Make sure that it's attractive from a social point of view. And also, yet again, I always say, don't, you don't have to show up at the New York Times. Mm. Just show up at the New York Times of your scene. Mm. That's all you need to be. Very true. And um, that kind of like brings me to, you know, saying like you mentioned like earlier uh, in the podcast, you mentioned, you know, Facebook isn't necessarily the end all be all. There are other platforms to look at, um, you know, omni-channel marketing, being present on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, potentially YouTube, Google ads. Uh, the other thing we want to touch on is email marketing. So the, the one little case study that we have is a, is a company that sells African artwork and actually called African artwork if anybody wants to go have a look. Um, s s like a shameless plug alert there for, <laughs> for, for them. But a very cool lady came to us in the beginning and said, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I've tried this, but doing it by myself for, for, for some time. Didn't really get the success that I would have wanted. Uh, I'm at a point where I really want to grow it. I need some expert advice and I'm willing to pay the price for it. Um, first three months, you know, did okay. There was some growth. Um, and then obviously as the data kind of like started becoming clear, we started optimizing campaigns. And the one thing we did was during the lockdown specifically and during December. So December is obviously a quiet month for, for e-commerce, for certain types of commerce, obviously. Yeah. Um, so it's obviously seasonal. But like, you know, people weren't necessarily spending too much money on African artwork during then. They were more concerned about buying, you know, gifts and paying for holidays and that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. And you don't necessarily buy someone a piece of artwork for their birthday necessarily. Or, you know, it's not such a regular thing. You'd rather buy them, you know, something smaller, like not a five grand or ten grand canvas. Um, so what ended up happening was during December, uh, we started running a lot of uh, 
lead magnets. So just having people to opt in to receive like a little booklet um, teaching you like, I think, I can't remember again, this was, uh, I think, Tamsin or, or Gilbert who did this. So I'm speaking under correction, but I think it went and, and we spoke about, you know, how to look at art or, you know, how to like identify good art. Mm. I can't even remember exactly what it did, but we added some type of value to, to the consumer. And that email list kept on building up. And during lockdown, we did the exact same thing. And during lockdown, the pricing of advertising was obviously extremely low because a lot of big brands, they were kind of like withholding advertising spend. Uh, we doubled down on spend for a lot of the companies uh, just purely because of the fact that it was a cheap cost and mm-hmm. th- these companies could also sustain themselves during these times. And you know, the thing the thing is, I want, I want to jump in before, before mm, you continue there, it. is the fact that if you have an agency that's managing this for you, we have, you know, the back-end knowledge of knowing most likely who's withholding budget. We, we're we working with this industry on a day-to-day, so we have the pulse on these sort of things. Now, without, you know, potentially working with you, they wouldn't have known that before previously. Exactly. No, very true. And uh, so what ended up happening was we kept on building a database. So these people weren't necessarily <laughs> buying artwork from her from the bat but they were interested in artwork and we knew that they were they probably just weren't ready to buy it and after lockdown april may i think it was may and she doesn't spend much i'm going to be very honest i'm going to disclose you i think we spent less than 10 grand uh, on her advertising we made over 120 grand back in sales wow um and majority of that came from facebook ads and the email list so the email list contributed and again i'm speaking on a correction but a large percentage um, of those sales came from the email list. I think it was like 40 or 50% or 40% or something like that. Um, just people who've already been in the database who were now ready to buy and they've obviously got a bit of a bit of uh, understanding of the business. They got to know her on a personal level a little bit more because she communicates quite often on social media and on emails. And uh, after lockdown, I think we did like a special 30% um, off on all artwork and it shot the lights out and had like a 10 or 11x return. I think even more. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was definitely way over 10. And it was one of the, the best case studies I've seen. I got like quite sentimental about like it was like quite mm-hmm. emotional to just to, because sometimes when you see these things, I don't a, a lot of business owners think we're just here to take people's money and like do yeah. our thing. Like we get invested emotionally in people's businesses. Yeah, because this is a game of impact at the end of the day, you know? 100%. So that's exactly it. Like we want to make an impact and we want to make a difference in people's and, and, and the business owner and obviously the people in that business. So, you know, we kind of like got quite emotional about that. And it was quite a, such a cool thing to say. And I think it touches on the point that like Facebook is not necessarily the end all be all. There are other platforms that you can look at in order to improve your marketing, improve your ROI in terms of your advertising spend and your and, and everything that obviously that you do for your business and, and from a contextual matter in terms of marketing. But yeah, that's kind of like what I wanted to round off with is saying like Facebook is obviously great and and, and you guys have done a good job for, for your clients and I think a lot of agencies are doing great jobs at the moment in South Africa. There's some really good agencies out there. And um, yeah, it's, it's a matter of like understanding that it's not a silver bullet and then following some best practices, being patient, learning as much as you can, looking at the data, giving Facebook time to do its thing, I suppose, is kind of like what it comes down to mm-hmm. and then kind of like maneuvering it and really building that puzzle piece with patience because if you're going to build a puzzle piece, you know, and rushing it, you are going to end up going to, you know, getting frustrated and you're, you're going to end up giving up. But what's the point of a puzzle if you're setting a time limit on it? The point is to build a puzzle because it's relaxing and it's fun and essentially it's, it's stimulating. So you're trying to challenge yourself. And I think that's kind of like how Facebook ads, you know, how, how it actually works. It's this puzzle piece that you have to see in front of you. Don't put a time limit on it necessarily, but figure it out. It's a challenge. Definitely, you know, and uh, to attest to that fact is there are so many people that are getting so much from this platform, from a business point of view, collecting so much revenue for their business, building their businesses on top of these platforms that, you know, chances are very highly likely that it will work for your business. No, awesome, man. So, Aaron, if anybody wants to reach out to you on Anga or Luna Digital, where can they get hold of you? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I'm, I'm pretty much a hermit, but the business is on is, is on uh, Instagram. We're on YouTube. Uh, you can go to lunadigital.co.za. That's, that's, our, that's our website. And uh, you'll more than likely find me and Anga on Instagram. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thank you again for coming through. It was lovely to have you in studio. Um, shared a lot of knowledge today. I really appreciate it. And from our side, yeah, we'll try and make a plan to have you on the podcast again. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming through, man. I really appreciate it. Anytime. Really appreciate that. All the Have best. a good one. Have a good one. Bye. Cheers.